Hey everybody, I'm Chef Julia Dunaway and instead of doing a cooking demo for you today, I decided I was going to tell you about my diet history. And the reason for that is because I've been following a whole food plant-based way of eating, I don't like to call it a diet, for almost three years now. It'll be three years in May. And I feel like this is the first time in my life since I was 10 years old that I haven't been dieting. And it's been such a wonderful experience that it made me think about all those years when I was really on a diet. Seems like since I was 10 years old, I was on some kind of diet. And I started thinking, I really wanted to share this so to see if anyone could relate. And also, just to kind of give you hope if you're stuck in some kind of dieting pattern and you can't get out of it, because I think there is hope. And so I wanted to tell you my story, because maybe you'll find it interesting. It seems like I'm going to be turning 69 this year in June. So I'm thinking, I've been around a long time. I've been through so many diets, so many things that you might not even recognize if you're young as to the way we used to diet back in the old days. And so I was just jotting down notes one day. I think I was telling my husband about this. And I said, you know what? This might be interesting to somebody else. Because I started taking notes and I filled up pages of just the things I've tried to lose weight. And it was so ridiculous, it made me just almost sick thinking about it. And the sad thing is, I was never really that fat. <laughs> if I look back on it, and it all started, some of it was kind of bordering on, you know, kind of, I hate to call it abuse, but it really was kind of like parental psychological abuse when it started. So I, I went back and started thinking, when did I first hear the word diet? Well, it, I was born in 1954. In 1964, when I was 10 years old, we had moved from Germany to California. And we were living in a rental house in Seaside, California. And I specifically remember my father and mother starting to tell me things like, you're getting chubby and um, you look fat, you're getting chubby. And I look back on those pictures and I really wasn't. I was probably, um, you know, normal size, but not skinny. But I used to be skinny. I was a skinny child. So I was no longer the skinny child. I started to get a little bit bigger. So my father and mother said, you need to quit eating so much. And my father even went so far as to say, you need to go on a diet. Well, my father was always dieting because he was very heavy. He was about 6'2" and he had a problem with eating. He would gain a lot of weight, have to lose it because he was in the military. So he was always on some kind of diet to lose weight because he couldn't fit into his uniforms and he had to be weighed by the doctors at the you know military base. And so he had all these reasons he had to constantly lose weight. So he was a big dieter and he knew all about dieting. So he would say things like, well, you need to go on a diet. So. I distinctly remember even being really young that he took us, my brother was also a little on the heavy side. He was a year older. He took us in the bathroom and he had the medicine, the old fashioned medicine cabinet with the glass door. And he had a chart on it, like a piece of paper like this. And he had our names and then a line for our weight, our starting weight and our weight every day. And he said, I'm going to keep track of your weight to see if you're losing weight and you need to follow my diet. So we said, okay, you know, well, we couldn't argue, we were kids. So he said, what you're going to do is you're going to quit eating so much and I'll tell you when you're eating too much and then you just stop. Because we were kids, we didn't know. He was, I was 10, he was 11. So I just remember from that point on, anytime I would eat anything, my father would say, that's not on your diet. Don't eat that. Don't eat sweets. Don't eat too many potatoes. Oh, don't eat too much rice. Uh, don't eat too much meat. And he would constantly be telling us, no, you're, you shouldn't eat that. You won't lose weight. So, of course, we didn't lose any weight because what my brother and I started doing at the age of 10 and 11 is we started hiding food from my father because he was watching us. And my mother was in on it, too. She was, whatever he said to do, she would do it, too. So she would say, Oh, yeah, yeah, you're going to get fat. You're not going to be pretty if you get fat. And so, you know, she was kind of in on it because she was thin. She never had a weight problem. So there we were. We would take food, cookies, crackers, 
anything we wanted and we would hide it in our rooms so that my parents wouldn't see it. And what was really sad was my mother would continue to buy high calorie food that we weren't supposed to eat. So it was kind of like it didn't make sense. She would buy, you know, hostess cupcakes and potato chips and cookies. And in her mind, it was okay because we should learn to eat a small amount of those foods. So she could regulate how much food she ate. She could eat two cookies and stop. She didn't ever have that desire to overeat. But I don't know, my brother and I both had this kind of binge eating tendency. And I think my father did too, because he would sit down and eat a whole half gallon of ice cream. And he would eat a whole sleeve of crackers and a jar of peanut butter at one time. Like he would sit there all night in front of the TV and he would eat peanut butter crackers, then eat a tub of ice cream. But we weren't supposed to eat any of that because we were on a diet. So we would be watching him thinking, oh my gosh, we're hungry, but we can't eat that because we're on a diet. So he was very hypocritical about it too. So we learned to hide food and we found ways to eat because we didn't like being monitored. And we were young, I don't think we understood what was happening to us psychologically because we were early in life developing this tendency to have some kind of unhealthy relationship with food. And it really, it started then. And so then it just continued. And my father had all these different things he would do. You know, he would try different versions of diets. He would say, oh, um, there's a grapefruit diet and the Mayo Clinic diet. And so we have to eat, you know, grapefruit before every meal. So let's try that. And he would try these different things. But of course, nothing worked because we weren't following the diet. And the other strange thing, this was in the 60s. So in 64, I was 10. So let's fast forward to 65, 66, 67. Well, my father got a second part-time job and he worked at night. And my mother worked at night too. She was a a server, a waitress in a high-end seafood restaurant. We lived on the Monterey Peninsula in California. So she would go to work at 2.30 and get home at midnight. Well, my father was in the army. He was a food service supervisor over all the mess halls on a big army base. So he would come home from work at whatever time, four o'clock. He would change clothes and he would go back to work at the military officers club or NCO club, one of the clubs, as a bouncer and he would work until 11 or 12 o'clock at night. So there we were, my brother and I, 12, 13 years old, at home by ourselves all night, six nights a week, and we had nothing to do, and this was, remember, in the 60s. So we had TV, and we weren't allowed to leave the house. So we were kind of stuck there at home with nothing to do but watch three channels on TV. So we would find ways to make food. Remember, we weren't supposed to be eating. We were supposed to eat whatever my mother left us for dinner. Well, we would make the most bizarre things. We would find things in the pantry and cook them from scratch. I would try to make cakes from flour and sugar and shortening. And the strangest thing that we did was my father was, he worked in the food services um, on the military base. And for whatever way he did it, I don't know, I can't tell you, he would bring home lots of meat from work. So he would have it wrapped in white butcher paper and it would be kind of all kinds of steaks, chicken, hamburger meat, but he had lots of filet mignons. Of course, we didn't know what that meant, but he, they were all labeled filet mignon, filet mignon. And all I remember is those were easy to cook and they tasted good. So we would defrost packages of meat and, you know, once they left, we would say, okay, let's make some steak sandwiches. And we would defrost this meat, and you, we didn't have a microwave. It was like 1966. We would defrost the meat by running water over it in the sink. And then once it was defrosted, we would cut it. It would be still kind of semi-frozen. We would cut it. And then we would fry it in a skillet with butter or oil or whatever. And then we would make sandwiches with it. And we didn't think my father would ever find out because we had so much meat in the freezer. And he didn't. He never really noticed that. And we would have steak sandwiches and potato chips. And this was in addition to our dinner. So what happened was we got bigger. The other thing that we did to fight against being told to diet was uh, my mother, being a waitress, had a bucket of money in her closet. 
she would take her change out when she got home at night and dump it in this big bin. And uh, it was everything from nickels to quarters to silver dollars to 50 cent pieces, whatever, you know, change you could get back in that time. And she never counted it. Eventually, she would finally, you know, roll everything into quarter, rolls of quarters, and she would cash in the money. But, you know, months could go by and she never touched it. And we knew that because we watched her. So um, we would get money out of my mother's closet and we knew how we could spend it because in those days, things would come through your neighborhood. I'm sure some of you recall the ice cream truck. <laughs> so the, every day the ice cream truck came through in the afternoon and we would have some money from my mother. We would go out and get ice cream, but we wouldn't just get one ice cream. We would get as many as we could get. We would get three or four different kinds of ice cream, chocolate ice cream, a, you know, nutty buddy cone and whatever. We would get three or four things each and we'd come in and hurry up and eat them. And then the other thing we would do is not every day, but often the local donut store had a donut truck and it would come through usually in the morning. So we would know when it came, it would make some kind of noise like a horn or something. And we would run outside and in those days for 30 cents or some ridiculous amount of money, you could get a dozen glazed donuts. So we would run out there, we would get a dozen, two dozen donuts for very little money, and we would run into the house and we would eat all the donuts. Okay, so a dozen donuts each or half a dozen, ice cream all afternoon. I would make cakes and cookies, whatever I could figure out how to make from my mother's couple of cookbooks, and then we would make sandwiches with meat from the freezer. All this time is when we were supposed to be on a diet. And so my father would weigh us and we would always be gaining weight. We would got bigger and bigger. And I didn't ever get really big at that age, but I was big enough that I was starting to feel uncomfortable. And then my father would weigh us and he would say, what's going on? You're, this diet's not working. You must have some kind of glandular problem. Or he would come up with something and he would say, you need to do exercise and he would try to get us to exercise like do he would have us do jumping jacks and sit-ups and stuff like they do in the army you know calisthenics he said well we need to do some kind of army fitness training and he would try to get us to do that well you know that didn't work very well because he couldn't be around to monitor us doing that but mainly he just couldn't understand why we weren't losing weight well the reason we weren't losing weight is because we were binging and eating everything in sight when they were gone. So what a terrible way for a child to grow up in their relationship with food. And that's what exactly what was happening. So uh, my father eventually, in the late 60s, like 67, he had to go to Vietnam for a year. And so he was gone for a year. So our jailer was gone, the person that was you know, making us eat a certain way. He took off, he was gone for a year, and it was just my mother. Well, my mother worked from 2.30 till midnight every day, six days a week. So she was never home. So it was just us. We were latchkey kids. We would come home from school. Nobody was there. My mother, she was such a, you know, trying so hard. She would make us a pot of stew or a pot of her, her main things that she would make over and over would be beef stew, spare ribs and sauerkraut, a, a recipe that she got in Germany, we lived in Germany for four years. So it'd be a big pot of pork ribs with sauerkraut. She would make curry for curry rice, teriyaki chicken, um, some kind of meatballs, meatloaf, spaghetti. You know your typical, what she thought American people should be eating. Because my father always said, make American food. So that's what she made. So we would come home, we would have that for our dinner, and we would eat you know, a normal amount. We wouldn't eat all of it because we knew they were watching us. And my mother was keeping track, too, of what we ate. So then for the rest of the night, we weren't allowed to leave the house, but we would still leave the house. We would walk down to the corner store, which was, you know, not really on the corner. We had to walk quite a ways to get to it. And we would walk to the store, buy candy. We would get ice cream truck stuff. We would just be eating junk all the time. I can't even tell you what we had. But when my father came back from Vietnam after a year, he was mad because he said we were fat. And, you know, I probably was. I think I was 13, almost 14. And I was definitely chubby then. And I have a picture. I couldn't find it. I was looking for it. 
I was getting ready to go to a dance in junior high and the dress I was wearing was kind of uncomfortably tight. And my father said something about, you look so fat in that dress. You would be such a pretty girl if you lost weight. And I started crying. Well, then by the time it was time to go to the dance, and I was going alone back then, we went alone. Uh, the picture that they took of me, my eyes are all swollen and red and I'm crying because they were both, my mother and father were both saying mean things to me. So that's how I remember being 14. So the story continues and as I get into high school. So um, next will be that part. So I left off when I was about 14, starting to get about 15, high school age. So I started to get taller. And so by the time I went into high school, it, I wasn't as big. It seemed like I kind of grew into my height, which is 5'7". I wasn't quite that tall. I was like 5'6". But <clears throat> things started to spread out a little bit more. So I really wasn't as big. I probably was about the size I am now. So right now I weigh about 140, between 140 and 144. And I think I probably weighed about that much at the beginning of high school, maybe a little bit more, but not much more. And I was still thinking that I was very fat <laughs> because in 1969, 1970, when I started high school, girls weighed about 110 pounds, okay? So back then, people were size five to seven. That was a normal size. I was a size 11, sometimes 13, which to me was huge because everybody else was super skinny. So even though I wasn't that big, I was still bigger than the average girl back in those days. That was a long time ago. I graduated from high school, I guess, you know, 50 years ago. So 50 years ago, high school girls were a lot skinnier. So I felt very uncomfortable. I felt very overweight, but not to the point where it kept me from having boyfriends. I still, you know, I was cute enough that I had boyfriends. I, you know, I have my high school graduation picture here. So this hairdo has to go, but the hairdo, you know, but you can tell by my face, I wasn't very big. I was not thin, but I wasn't obese, but I felt big inside. And I had a really bad relationship with food. I talked about dieting all the time, but diets back then, in, when I was in high school, mostly the dieting I did was counting calories, kind of, but mostly just starving. There was no real diet industry at that time. So m mainly it was my father's kind of diet, like, you know, grapefruit diet or just don't eat so much and eat three meals a day and don't eat sweets and cut out all the, it was kind of like cut out food diet. That was kind of the popular diet. But then <clears throat> I decided I was going to lose weight once and for all. I wanted to get off all my excess weight and somewhere around the time I was a senior in high school, right after I graduated, that my father heard about a new diet called the Doctor's Weight Loss Diet by Dr. Stillman. And it was kind of like the Atkins diet that we know of, but it was more restricted. In the Stillman diet, all you could eat was eggs, meat, and cottage cheese. You couldn't have dairy products, no carbs at all, no vegetables, nothing. Eggs, meat, and cottage cheese basically was all. And so my father said, <clears throat> this Stillman diet is really good. You'll lose a lot of weight eating this. And he went on it and he lost a bunch of weight. Of course, he always gained it back, but at the time, you know, I didn't know. And so I said, okay, I'll, I'll go on that diet. And so I went on this diet where it said all you could eat. So I thought, man, this is great. This is the first time anyone's ever said I could have all I wanted. And so I ate tons of whatever, chicken, beef, pork. And I just distinctly remember making like six eggs and a half a package of bacon and sitting down and having a giant plate of bacon and eggs because I could have all I wanted. Well, that was not a very healthy diet. You start feeling kind of sick. You start feeling weak. You just feel terrible because your body just can't digest nothing but protein. At some point, it catches up with you and you don't feel very well and you get constipated and you get lightheaded and it's just a bad feeling. So I experienced all that. I did lose a bunch of weight and I felt really good. I thought, oh, finally I'm getting skinny. 
well, that's not a good way to get skinny. Because as soon as I went to wherever it was, you know, McDonald's, we had McDonald's then, you know, as soon as I went and got a burger and fries, within a few days I gained the weight back that I lost. So it was pretty, pretty useless diet. But I, you know, I ate stuff like that. And we also had the AIDS, A-Y-D-S, which they went out of business when AIDS in the 80s came out because you couldn't have a diet supplement called AIDS, but it was a, a candy and you ate it and it was supposed to reduce your appetite. But it didn't work, it really didn't. But we thought it did and we would eat these AIDS candies in order to maybe, you know, have a reduced appetite, but that didn't work. So, um, you know, and there were different liquid proteins and different things that came out. And um, it, after I graduated from high school, I joined the Air Force. So in order to get into the Air Force, I had to lose weight because the recruiter brought me to get sworn in for the Air Force. And he looked at me and he didn't think I was very heavy because I didn't look really fat. But I was, I remember this like it was yesterday. I weighed 153 pounds, and the weight limit for my height was 141 pounds at that time. They late raised it later, but it was like 141 pounds. And the recruiter was, he could not believe that I weighed 153 pounds. And so I, I failed the physical, and he brought me all the way back. I had to go to like San Francisco and then come back 100 miles. And I had to lose the weight and then go back again. So of course I went on some starvation diet. I didn't eat. I basically did not eat other than water, lettuce, you know, grapefruit, whatever it was, the most restrictive thing you could eat until I lost that, whatever it was, you know, 12, 13 pounds. And I lost it really fast. So I went, I got down to the 140 pounds, went back and passed the physical, got into the Air Force. So then once you're in the military, you have to follow the military way of um, weight loss, of weight management, because they weigh you <laughs> on a regular basis. So they have a weight standard, and the weight standard for my height was at 141. I think it later went up to like 148, and that was what I had to weigh. And they did something called no notice weigh-in. So you would be going about your business, you know, at your job, and they would call you in to the commanding officers they called it the orderly room. And they would say, this is your no notice weigh in, get on the scale. And if you were over your weight limit, they put you on a special program and they called it the fat boy program. No kidding, they called it that. They would say, you failed your weigh in, you're on the fat boy program. And you have to come for weigh ins now once a week. And if you don't lose the weight, we'll kick you out of the military. Now think about that, how much pressure that would put on you to always be dieting because somebody's going to call you in and weigh you. It was just like childhood. So that happened. I was in there 1973 until 1976. And I managed to stay at my weight limit, but I was always worried about it. I was always dieting. And it was weird because, you know, like even in basic training, we were active all day long. We were marching. We were always doing stuff. You would think nobody would gain weight. I gained weight in basic training because it was a all you could eat situation. So we would be, you know, running around all day. We couldn't have food in our barracks. So we would go to the dining hall for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and we would have all the food we could eat. Well, I was starving all the time. So I would eat huge quantities of breakfast, lunch, and dinner. It was like I had no way to stop the amount of food I wanted to eat. I was kind of like obsessed with food then because of dieting. So I would eat gigantic quantities of food in the mess hall. Well, I immediately started gaining weight in basic training. So my uniforms were all kind of tight and they didn't fit well from the very beginning. And then I was uh, stationed at my first base. I was a military policewoman, one of the first in the Air Force. They opened up that career field in 1973. So I was in one of the first groups there was a lot of pressure on me to be a military policewoman when they didn't really want us in there. They wanted to keep us in clerical jobs. So I went to my first assignment at Reese Air Force Base in Texas. And I, you know, I looked okay. I had my uniforms. I had a job. I was a military policewoman. I did pretty well. 
and I managed to keep my weight stable. But it was hard. I was always, you know, on some kind of low calorie diet, always worried about it. I could never relax. And I ended up getting married to an officer in 1975 and getting transferred to a base in Japan, Tachikawa Air Force Base, when I was about 20 years old. So I got assigned over there. I was married, got assigned over there. I had to wait for him to come for a while. So once I got over there, I was on my own for the first time ever, really, just totally on my own um, <clears throat> in a foreign country. And same thing, you know, there were lots of things going on. I had to work and lived in the barracks and, you know, just kind of make my life away from everybody I knew. And I did okay. And, you know, dieting and all that was in the background. But I went home to visit my parents from time to time. And when I would go home to visit my parents, my father always had a new diet. And he would always tell me, oh, try this, try that. And one time I went home and, you know, it was after the, I'd been in the Air Force for a while. And he said, I got a new diet that's going to work really good. It's called the Protein Sparing Fast, the Last Chance Diet. He said, I read a book and he said, I got some. You want to try it? I said, okay. And he had a bottle of this stuff and it smelled like leather. It was the most foul smelling liquid you could ever imagine. And he said, we just drink this three times a day and we'll lose 20 pounds in a week. I said, okay, because I was always trying to lose weight. I was never happy with the weight I was at. So I drank his protein sparing fast and I could not drink it. it. You know, it made me throw up. It was so bad. But he drank it and it didn't work. He couldn't stick with it either. Well, a short time later, I read in the news somewhere that that protein sparing fast killed people. They died from it. It was that bad. But that's the kind of thing my father was obsessed with dieting and he would try to get me to do stuff like that. So I got away from my parents, lived in Japan for about five years. And while I was in Japan, they had Weight Watchers. And you know, I never had tried Weight Watchers before. So I thought, hey, I'm gonna try this. This might work for me. Because I had gained a lot of weight when I had my first child in 1977. So I was about 23, I had my first child, and I gained, I probably gained like 40 pounds, which I thought was a lot at the time. And I didn't lose it all after I had her, I still weighed, I think I weighed 150 pounds, which right now, that doesn't sound like much because I've weighed much more than that in my life. But I was young, I weighed 150 pounds, which was high back then, 1977, and I went to Weight Watchers. And I got on the scale and I weighed 150 pounds and they said, your goal weight is 128 pounds. That's what you should weigh, 128 pounds. I said, okay. So I went to Weight Watchers meetings. Well, I don't know if anybody has, uh, is familiar with Weight Watchers in the 1970s. I think Weight Watchers started in the 60s, but this was the first generation of Weight Watchers. And Weight Watchers then was very, very, very strict. They had certain things you could eat, and you had to eat exactly those things. There was no leeway, there was no point system, there was no eat what you like. It was, you had to eat, you know, four ounces of, four to six ounces of meat, two pieces of bread, three vegetables, two of this, one of that. And you had to eat those exact things, and you could not change them out or exchange them. You had to eat those. So for example, you had to eat, you could eat two pieces of bread a day, but you could not eat anything made of flour or anything to substitute the bread. Or you could eat rice, I think rice was an option. So we would take the bread and we would mash it up and make some kind of cake with it because we had to use the bread. We couldn't use flour. I know it sounds weird, but we made all kinds of weird stuff with bread. So I successfully lost my weight on Weight Watchers. I lost from 150 to 129. And I have a picture of me in Japan when I weighed 129 pounds. And I was so thin. I sent that picture to my parents and they asked if I was sick. They said, have you been sick? You look so skinny in that picture. You look like you're sick. I said, no, I just went to Weight Watchers and lost the weight. So they, they were impressed. They thought that was pretty cool that I lost all that weight. 
Well, that started me in the whole Weight Watchers kind of cycle. And the Weight Watchers cycle, and I don't know if anyone can relate to this, but maybe you can, is you go to the meeting once a week and you weigh in. So you go there, you weigh in, they record your weight. Oh, you lost two pounds, that's great. So once I lost all my weight, I would go there. I, oh, you know, you're stable, you're good. You're gonna become a lifetime member because you maintain your weight for a certain period and you become a lifetime member. So I became a lifetime member. But in the meantime, once I got through weighing in at Weight Watchers, then we would go out to dinner somewhere. And because Weight Watchers I don't know, once you become a lifetime member, it wasn't as strict as I recall. I don't remember exactly, but I would cheat on the Weight Watchers. And we would go out to dinner. And we would go to things like it was Japan, so they had an um, officer's club. And every Thursday night, they had Mongolian barbecue. And Mongolian barbecue was like a buffet. You would load up your bowl with all these vegetables and meats, and then they would stir fry them for you and give it back to you with rice. It's a huge amount of food. Go there. And then some nights they had, they called it Chinese Viking Buffet. And it was like a Chinese restaurant full of every kind of item and this long buffet line. And you go, you can go as many times as you want, fill up your plate, all fried, all greasy, all rich. So I'd go through there and eat two or three plates. Well, you can probably guess that within some period of time I started gaining the weight back. So by the time I left Japan, which was 1980, and I was still really young, I was, uh, let's see, I would have been about 26, I had gained back quite a bit of the weight. I was back in the 150s then, and I had a little child, a three-year-old, and we returned to the States, and we were stationed in Utah, Salt Lake City, Utah, actually Ogden, Utah and I was accepted into graduate school. So I was accepted into the Graduate School of Social Work in Salt Lake City, which was about an hour drive from Ogden, Utah. Lived, had our own house, it was really nice, had my daughter, and I didn't think that much about food because my husband at the time, he was very nice and supportive. He wasn't you know, obsessed with weight or dieting or anything like that. And, Seemed like we just kind of ate normal food. I didn't, I wasn't obsessed with anything, but my weight had kind of stabilized in the 150s or so, maybe a little higher. And I went to graduate school for a couple of years, got a job, and my weight was a little bit high. It was, you know, it was not a comfortable weight. It was probably in the 150s or 160s. Well, then I got pregnant. So I got pregnant with my second child and I gained a bunch of weight. I got up into the 180s this time. And, you know, it wasn't such a terrible thing that I gained that much weight, but it was starting to affect me because I was trying to get back into the Air Force. And to get back into the Air Force as an officer, because I had been out of the Air Force for a couple of years, to get back in, I had to pass the physical. And they accepted me into the Air Force, but they said, you know, you have to pass the physical once you have the baby. And your weight has to be, uh, it was 148 at that time. And I was thinking, oh my gosh, I weigh 185. How am I going to get to 148 right after I have the baby? He was due in early July, and I had to pass the physical in mid-September. So I started thinking, I need to start losing weight now. So while I was pregnant with my son, I went on a diet. I got... I think it was, I'm pretty sure it was Optifast. That was what was out at that time, 1982. I got Optifast and I started drinking Optifast twice a day and eating a small meal at night and walking every day, like three, four miles an hour a day. I would just go out and walk and drink this Optifast and eat one meal a day. And I quickly lost weight. While I was pregnant, I went from 184 and got down to like 160. I lost about 20 pounds while I was pregnant. That's really a stupid thing to do. Um, and I was also smoking while I was pregnant. You know, and, and back then they didn't really have as much information. They didn't tell you not to smoke. They basically said cut down. So I, I didn't smoke a lot, I didn't think, but I smoked enough. So by the time I had my son, who was born two weeks late, so there I was, pregnant, 
It was late, I was stressed out. About the time I was pregnant with my son, losing weight, my father died. And talk about stressful time in my life, it was awful. And so I was under stress because of my mother falling apart, my father dying, and my husband lost his job. So my husband lost his job at that time, and we had no income from him. I was trying to get into the Air Force, and all these other things happened. So needless to say, it was a really terribly tough time, but I did get into the Air Force. My son was born. I got an assignment, and you know, I was back in the same thing. I was in the Air Force, back on the weight management program, you know, how, being hounded about my weight. But I was an officer now, so I had a good career, start to a good career. The bad thing was my son, because of all the things that happened during my pregnancy, losing weight, smoking, stress, I don't know what it was, he ended up being born late but being underweight. He only weighed four pounds, 10 ounces, even though he was two, month, two weeks past his due date. And he had a lot of health problems. He, was, he started out having like asthmatic problems, skin problems. He had problems from the time he was a baby, speech problems, everything you could think of. And now he's, he's doing pretty well. He's, he's normal, but at the time we didn't know what was gonna happen with him. But I think that he would have been a lot better off had I not gone through all this crazy dieting stuff when I was pregnant with him. But that just goes to show you how, you know, how much stress is on losing weight and what it can do to you. Because, you know, I, I was, I was kind of desperate to get that job. I didn't really see any other options at the time. So fast forward a little bit into the mid 80s. I was in the Air Force as an officer. I was still doing the same old thing, you know, crash diet, up and down, up and down trying to stay under the radar of the military so they wouldn't harass me. And I had another child in 1985, moved to Texas, so I've been here in Texas since 1985, and I gained even more weight with him. So there I was, back in the same thing, having to lose weight after a pregnancy. And you know, then we had Weight Watchers around here. So I joined Weight Watchers. They, at that time, they had a point system. So I tried that one where it was a lot more lenient and you could use the point system to lose weight and you know join the Weight Watchers and I was a lifetime member and I did that and it was it was okay it was somewhat successful but never for long because I would always do that same old thing I would do well for a few days go to the meeting have a loss and then I would go out and, and have something to eat because it was kind of like somebody was monitoring you but then you could go cheat so I had kind of that cheating mentality. And so I never really had any success in keeping weight off. It was just more of the same. I had another child in 1990, number four, at the age of 36. And with that child, I got up to about 240 pounds. Okay, so let's think about that. It was 100 more pounds than what I weigh now. And I had gestational diabetes. I had swollen ankles. I was a mess. And, you know, I just, it was like I couldn't stop eating. I was just eating so much food that, <clears throat> you know, I gained weight, the doctor was worried about me, I was older, had all those issues that they tell you when you're an older pregnant woman, things can go wrong. So, you know, I was under a lot of stress for that. But fortunately, I ended up having a healthy baby and I came home from the hospital weighing about 220 pounds. So, you know, I didn't lose very much weight when I had the baby. She only weighed eight and a half pounds. So I still had all that weight to lose, but I had to get back to work in the military. I was in the military still. <clears throat> no, no, I was out of the military. I was out of the military then. But, <clears throat> you know, I, I still had to lose that weight. I still had to get the weight off. And it's hard to get weight off when you gain that much. So what did I do to lose the weight then? I basically did the same old thing, low calorie dieting. But by that time, all these new diets had come out. Low fat was popular. So, you know, eat nothing but low fat food. I tried that. You know, the carb restricted diets, 
low protein, high protein, low carb diets, whatever was in the vogue then. And I have so many diet books, you can't even imagine the number of diet books I have collected. I have a whole list that I could tell you, but I'll save that for later. Excuse me. <clears throat> so, um, but what happened when, when my daughter was a, this is the youngest daughter, so I was 37, <clears throat> I, I started thinking that maybe I was a food addict because I could never lose the weight and keep it off. So, you know, 36 years old, I never could lose weight and keep it off. So I ran across some book or something and it was called Food Addicts Anonymous. And I thought, I'm gonna try this. So in Food Addicts Anonymous, the only, the rules were you could eat, you couldn't have sugar, wheat, or flour. Those were the big rules. No sugar, wheat, or flour. And you had to eat three meals a day. You had to have protein at every meal, a certain amount, meat, eggs, or whatever. Um, you couldn't eat anything really high fat. I don't believe we could have cheese or anything like that. It was mostly just protein and grains. You could have brown rice or certain grains and no bread, because nothing with flour in it, no sugar, so no desserts, no sweets. You could have vegetables, meat, and grains. That was about it, and you know, starchy vegetables. No alcohol. So I thought, okay, I could do this. It's easy, I'll just follow this. And I followed that for about two years. And I lost from my heavier weight after I had my fourth child to about 155 pounds, which was really low for me at that time because I had been, you know, a lot bigger. So um, I did that for a couple years, but it was so restrictive. And at that time, people didn't do restrictive diets as much. And I remember when we were traveling, you know, everybody would want to stop at fast food or this or that, you know, and I couldn't eat any of that food because it had sugar, wheat, or flour. I would have to eat like the hamburger patty. And um, I just remember always having to stop at places like cafeterias or restaurants that had a regular menu and it was a big pain. And I remember visiting my aunt in uh, North Carolina at one time when you know, I was on that diet and she got really mad at me. She said, you know, why didn't you tell me you were on this special diet? Now I have to make all this special food for you. And I said, no, you don't have to make any special food. I can just eat the meat and, the, you know, starchy vegetables or whatever. I just can't eat bread or desserts or whatever. And, but, oh, she just thought that was the biggest imposition. She got so mad. But, you know, um, I look back on it. And at that time, it was probably for a hostess in the South, having someone who didn't eat what everyone else ate was a big deal. So... I didn't hold it against her. But after a couple of years of that, I just couldn't do it anymore. I was just tired of it. It was so restrictive. I got, I think I just decided I was gonna incorporate other food and start eating a little bit. You know, that's what I always did was say, oh, I'm just gonna have a little bit of this. And I think I can, you know, incorporate small amounts of food into my diet now. I'm over being addicted to food. So that's what I did. Well, that didn't work. So. Basically, you know, about that time, I started gaining weight back. I just kind of let go, and I didn't, I didn't keep up with the weight. I just kind of, you know, ate whatever I wanted. I thought, I'll just eat what I like. And, it, and I think around that time, I came across intuitive eating, kind of the opposite of Food Addicts Anonymous. And there were lots of articles and books out then about, um, you know, learn to eat anything you want. You don't have to restrict yourself. Eat whatever you want. And just stop eating when you're full. So I got all kinds of books and courses on this intuitive eating. I can't even remember what it was called, but there were whole programs about it. Janine Roth, that was the author. So I did that for a while. Well, that didn't really work because I guess I'm one of these people that as soon as I taste something that like a sweet or a cookie, I want to eat the whole thing. I, you know, the idea that I could sit there and eat two cookies out of a box just didn't work for me. I would eat the two cookies, but I knew the box was still there because I was the kind of person that 
my way of eating what I wanted to eat was to go to the store and buy a box of Pepperidge Farm cookies, you know, the kind that has a, like a variety pack, and a bag of Doritos and a block of cheddar cheese and sit and eat within a couple days all the Doritos, all the cheese or some of the cheese and the whole box of cookies and just keep eating it until it was gone. That was my idea of eating what I wanted to eat. And the idea of eating a little bit of it and leaving it, just, I couldn't do it. Every time I tried to do it, it would backfire. The same thing with the cheater's diet. I thought, okay, well, I will eat, you know, very, very clean, very strict for four days, and then, or five days, whatever it was, and then one day you get to cheat, and then the next day you go right back on it. So out of Seven days, you have one cheat day, it could be any day. So I thought, oh, this is the answer to my prayers. I'll have a cheat day. And so I would pick a day and I would eat, you know, just nothing but vegetables and protein and fruit. And then on my cheat day, I would line up all the things I was gonna go have. I was gonna go have a burger and fries. And <clears throat> I was gonna have donuts for breakfast. And then, you know, spaghetti for dinner. But what you were supposed to do is after the cheat day, get rid of all the food. And you weren't supposed to binge. You were supposed to eat a meal, like a normal size meal. Well, no, did I do that? No, I would eat a huge amount of everything for the whole day, like binge. And then the next day I would be like, oh, you know, I'm, I gain weight really easily. So the next day I would just be like bloated and my face would be all puffy and I'd feel horrible. So those kind of cheater diets never worked for me. So I actually got kind of big. By 1994, I was weighing around 180 pounds. So when I was 40, I remember I got a job. I got recommissioned back into the military in 1994. And the branch of military was the United States Public Health Service. And they weren't as strict about weigh-ins and all of that stuff. So I kind of slid in the door without anybody really noticing how overweight I was. Got uniforms, the whole thing, but early on I weighed 180 pounds when I got into that that um, service and my uniforms were like size 18. They were huge. Like if I went to get those uniforms out now, like I'm wearing size 8 to 10 now, and they were kind of, they were size bigger than regular clothes. So I would say those would be the equivalent to size 14s, not 18s. They were like 14, 16, but they were smaller, so they would have a bigger size on them, kind of like a wedding dress. You know, a size 18 wedding dress with, uh, fits a person who wears 14. It's kind of like that. So, um, you know, I was heavy. I was big, and I looked awful. I look at those pictures of me in the, the military uniform in 1994, 1995, I was really, really uncomfortably big, and I felt bad. And, um, <clears throat> you know, but I was busy working and had four kids, that, trying to take care of four kids, working full time. I just wasn't concerned about it. Well, then in 1997, I read about a new program that was really popular. It was called FinFin. So I don't know if any of you are familiar with FinFin, but FinFin is Fentermine, fenfluramine, and it was legal. You could go to a doctor's office and you were prescribed two medications. Fentermine, I think, was like a, almost like speed, and fenfluramine was another medication. I don't know what was in it. But the combination of the two would cause you to lose weight. So I thought, okay, good. I'm gonna get this weight off once and for all. So I went there weighing 180 or whatever it was, and I had to go back every week. I'd get my pills, take the pills, the pills killed my appetite. So I'm a person who, in the past, I've always been hungry. Like, you know, I get up in the morning hungry. I would eat breakfast and then I would be hungry after breakfast. I'd be thinking about a snack. After the snack, I'd be thinking about lunch. After lunch, I'd be thinking about a snack. I was hungry all the time. All food tasted good to me and I could never get enough. So like, you know, if um, I went to a restaurant and got, for example, at my job before the, I got back into the military, I was working at a managed care clinic and we could go out for lunch. So I would go to Boston Market, which is like, they called it Boston Chicken at the time. And I would get a meal 
and I would get the special meal and it had two chicken quarters, two of them. And um, I would get like stuffing, cream spinach, and something else. And it would come with a cornbread muffin or something. It was a huge amount of food. I would take it back to my office. I would eat the whole thing. Okay, imagine I ate that much food just for lunch. And I thought that was fine. I was enjoyed it. So I was used to eating huge quantities of food and enjoying it. Then I would come home and make dinner and have a big dinner. So um, when I took the Fin Fin, I didn't want to eat anything. I would get up in the morning. I didn't want breakfast. So I would have whatever, you know, a piece of toast. Lunchtime would come around. I would eat some small, you know, frozen dinner or something. I'd get home from work, make dinner for everybody. I would sit down and eat a few bites and then I would be done. Well, of course I lost weight. Within about three months, I went from 180 to 150. So there I was back at 150, which was my low weight as an adult. And I was definitely getting skinnier. But that medicine stopped working about three months into it. And, um, you know, I could tell because I started wanting to eat again. And food started tasting better. It was like, no, it just wasn't working anymore. Well, about the time that it stopped working and I started regaining the weight, the news came out that the fin-fin combination was causing people to have heart murmurs or heart palpitations or whatever it was. I can't remember what it was, but it was serious. It was something that people were reporting that they were you know, having some serious negative side effects, and I had to go get checked for this. I had to go get a cardi echocardiogram to see if it had affected me. Thank God it didn't. But of course, we had to all go off it and it, it left the market. So, of course, I gained all the weight back. That was a big failure. And, you know, then by the late 90s, 2000, my weight stabilized in like the 170s because I had to keep my weight at a certain level. I was still wearing a uniform. And it was like between 170 and 180, depending on whether I was traveling or not. And I met um, my husband, Steve, and I wanted to lose weight because I was dating him and, you know, I didn't want to have this, you know, extra weight everywhere. So I started going on my low calorie diet again, but this time it was a little bit healthier. I just basically ate fruits and vegetables lean proteins and cut out a lot of junk food and I just you know exercised did a lot of kind of normal stuff and lost weight and of course when you're in love you're not so hungry so I was kind of in that hi I met somebody and we went out and I didn't overeat and so I lost a bunch of weight I got down to like 160 something so I, it wasn't that much but you know I still looked pretty decent and I kept that weight down in the 160s. We got married in 2002. I weighed like 165 in my wedding pictures. You can tell I'm not really big, but I'm not slim. I'm, I've got, you know, I've kind of got things camouflaged, but I, I was okay. And while we were married, my weight fluctuated a little bit, you know, up and down, but I tried every kind of diet program, always. Anything new that came out, I tried it. I have a whole list of things I tried but mainly diet and exercise. And I was looking, I have diet books. I can just tell you a few of them because it would be so boring. Well, I, in my life I tried Slim Fast, Fit for Life, which was food combining, Macrobiotics, I tried that for a while, very boring to me. Um, Blue Zones Diet, and that was the one that I kind of came up with toward the end. But I'll, I'll talk about that a little more in a uh, little bit more in a minute. But I had books about the carb cycle solution, clean eating, the portion tellers plan. Just control your portions. Juice yourself thin. The reverse diet. Eat breakfast for dinner. Or eat dinner for breakfast. You know, reverse. You know, eat more at night and less in the morning. More in the morning and less at night. Um, the belly fat cure, eat this, not that. Uh, here's one, the F it diet, I won't say the world word. And that was another one of those, eat whatever you want. And there's a whole, you know, uh, Instagram and a big movement about just be happy with how you look and don't worry about what you eat, eat whatever you want. 
And then um, I tried Dexatrim, and I never tried Metafast, but I tried different kind of liquid diets, you know, where you would drink something that was supposed to fill you up. And there was even one called the Starch Blockers Program. And this was probably in the 80s. And you got all these pills, and before every meal you took three or four of these pills, and then you could eat as much as you wanted. So I thought, oh great, I could eat all the rice I want. So I would take the three pills, eat a giant bowl of rice, because I liked rice. I didn't lose any weight. Imagine that. So those are all the things I was doing for so long. And then, you know, I started thinking about the long term. So in the 2000, mid-2000, eight or so, Blue Zones came out. And before that, the Okinawa diet was out, talking about longevity and people who, you know, ate a diet that helped them live a long and healthy life. So I was kind of aware of those things. And I got the Blue Zones diet and thought, okay, this is a new way of looking at it. Eat more plants, eat a plant-based diet, eat more vegetables, eat less meat. But they still allowed 5%, 90 to 95% plant-based, the rest you could have small portions of pork, fish, whatever. So to somebody like me, that was like, oh, well, I can still have it. I'll just have that. And of course, I could never get away from overeating that because I was still eating it. So that didn't work out for me. But I still, you know, tried. But then in 2008 and 9, I went to culinary school. So I went into culinary school weighing my normal one, you know, 70 or so. Well, I gained about 15 pounds in culinary school because as soon as I got there, I was 54 in culinary school. They said this is a classic French culinary school. We are going to use clarified butter and we use full fat everything and everything seemed to have some kind of meat in it and lots of salt. And we made pastries and stuff in, in our pastry semester. So over the course of that year and a half, I gained about 15 pounds. And it was really hard. I was working full time and going to culinary school at night and doing stuff on the weekends. And I developed a, a kind of a taste for this really rich food. That wasn't good either. So after I graduated, say 2010, I started my chef business. And I thought, well, I'm gonna have dinner parties and different occasions for people where I cook them food and teach them how to cook food. And I did that from 2010 until 2017. I did some kind of private chef thing where I did dinners and classes about regular food, not healthy food. And, you know, my weight stayed about the same. I didn't really, I, I lost a few pounds, gained a few pounds, lost a few pounds, gained a few pounds, and I was still on active duty. So I went through periods where I would get really strict about eating healthy and get down to like 160 or so. And then I would keep it off for a little while, exercise a lot, gain it back. And then 2018, I decided that I was gonna really stick with the Blue Zones diet and, and try to keep anything that wasn't plant-based very minimal. So that's what I did in 2018. 2019 and I was mostly plant-based. I think I, I could say at that time I quit teaching all classes that were not plant-based. So I started only teaching plant-based classes and I was reading Forks Over Knives, watching the videos and really adopting the plant-based diet. And the main reason for that is because my health was starting to suffer. I come from a family where we had heart disease, gout, kidney disease, all kinds of health problems, congestive heart failure, cardiac problems, everything, hardening of the arteries, atherosclerosis, you name it. My mother and father had all these conditions. My brother died when he was 59 of complications related to kidney disease. So I knew that the things that were going wrong with my health were going to catch up with me. I had high cholesterol, it was 240. My blood pressure was not being controlled well. It was high even though I was taking medicine. I had this extra weight I couldn't get rid of. My feet were swelling from the blood pressure medicine. I was taking thyroid medicine. I didn't feel good. I could just tell. And if you look at pictures of me from those years, my face would be real puffy, my eyes would be puffy from, you know, I guess the sodium and extra weight because it shows up in my face really quickly. So I thought, well, the plant-based way was a way to go and I ate plant-based. 
and I pretty much cut out all things that were not plant-based in 2018, 19, 2020, but I didn't lose any weight. I kind of got stuck in the 160s and I never could get out of it and I would fluctuate. Sometimes I would go up to 170 again. So in uh, 2020, about the time of COVID, you know, I was doing my videos on Facebook Live every day for about 50 days. And I was looking at those videos going, oh my gosh, I look so big. And I thought that that wasn't a very good look for a person who was supposed to be telling people how to eat healthy, whole food, plant-based, no oil. I thought, well, if I'm eating so healthy, why do I look so unhealthy? So in May of 2020, I decided I was going to try to do something healthier and stick with it. And that's when I started eating the Daily Dozen. I had read the book, How Not to Die by Dr. Michael Greger. And so I knew you know, about the whole food, plant-based, no oil diet and how to do a healthier version than what I was doing. Because what I was doing was, I was eating plant-based, no oil, but I would eat too much of everything. Like, you know, if the meal was beans and rice, I would eat three servings of it. You know, I wouldn't just eat a serving of beans, a serving of rice, and a bunch of salad and fresh vegetables. I would eat all the beans and rice and none of the vegetables because I like the beans and rice better. So I was never losing any weight. And I would eat, um, I would learn how to make baked goods like hippie banana bread or something that tasted good, but I would eat a lot of it. I wouldn't just eat a small piece. And so I couldn't lose any weight. So I decided to try eating just the daily dozen for 21 days and see if I could lose weight and you know get my creeping cholesterol back down or down to a, a reasonable level because I had been off of cholesterol medication for the last year or so because going plant-based helped me reduce my cholesterol. But it went, came back up. That's what will happen even if you're eating plant-based, if you're eating a lot of high fat food, junk food, whatever. So I went, um, I started eating according to the Daily Dozen and exercising more in May of 2020, May 18th. And I said, I'm going to stick with this. I'm going to follow the recommended portion sizes and eat all the vegetables, the fruit, measure out grains so that I'm not eating three times the amount of grains he recommends. And um, focusing on eating everything, more fresh vegetables, more low calorie dense food and less high calorie dense food. And I did that and within 21 days, my cholesterol went from, one, from 211 to 170 and my blood pressure dropped too. So my blood pressure was lower because I was losing weight. And I thought, oh my goodness, I should have been doing this all along. So I thought, I'm gonna keep doing this. So I kept on doing these 21 day challenges, asked people to come along with me and do it. So I did 21 day challenges pretty much since May of 2020, I've never stopped doing 21 day challenges. Every three weeks or so I start a new one and I follow them along with everybody else I've asked to. I still eat the daily dozen, which is basically three servings of beans, three servings of grains, a serving of berries, two servings of greens, three servings of vegetables, some flaxseed, some very small amount of nuts. Uh, let's see what else, lots of water, exercise 90 minutes a day. And I do, I walk every single day. Some days I take one day off, but my walking is up to five miles a day, and then I do weight training. So the combination of doing cardio every day, <clears throat> of eating a lot more vegetables and fruit and a lot less of any kind of processed vegan food and a lot less of anything that wasn't part of the daily dozen, I lost all that weight. I lost from 170 at the beginning of 2020 to 140, one or two at the beginning, at the beginning of 2023. So, you know, that's almost 30 pounds I've kept off since I started this. It is really great not to be dieting. So the reason I wanted to tell you my whole diet story was to leave you with this, that when you're following the whole food, plant-based, no oil way of eating and doing it in a way that's balanced, meaning that you're eating plenty of vegetables, plenty of raw vegetables, plenty of fruit, some protein from beans, tofu, whatever it is you like to eat, 
<clears throat> plant-based and you know having greens and berries and I have a smoothie every day that I have been able to be full not be obsessed with food not feel like cheating all the time and it's a really good feeling not to be obsessed with dieting and I think I thought I had written that down somewhere but I think that's the main thing I wanted to leave you with is I don't want to ever consider myself a dieter so I don't diet anymore I just follow my plant-based way of eating I just call it this is the way I eat and it's not temporary it's permanent so no matter what if I do stray away like let's say we go on a trip and I eat something that's richer than normal something with oil in it I don't say that oh I'm gonna go off my diet and eat oil-based food now for the rest of the trip I'll eat the thing, whatever it was, and say, okay, well, that was good. But then my very next meal, I eat my normal food, whatever it is, fruit with oatmeal or salad for lunch with some other thing that's, you know, within the realm of what I eat. And I'll plan for my dinner. So I'm not going this back and forth, up and down thing that I did all my life. And it's, it's really been kind of a liberating experience not to be a part of the diet culture or not to be thinking about oh maybe I could try this maybe I could try that because so many times I tried different diets and they never worked and here I did something that wasn't a diet and three years later it's still working and I'm not obsessed with food and the best thing is I'm not hungry so I mean not hungry in the way I used to be hungry so I wake up in the morning I'm mildly hungry I go for my five mile walk, I come back, I make breakfast. I eat breakfast about 10 o'clock. I'm never hungry until like two or three in the afternoon. Physically hungry, I don't think about food. Well, in the past when I was eating diet food or dieting, I'd be hungry all the time thinking about the next thing I was gonna eat. And now I just have something small at three o'clock, maybe a snack, and then I have a, a normal sized dinner. It's not really that big, but a normal dinner and maybe a snack after dinner like a, a bowl of fruit. But I'm not obsessed with food. And that is the best thing, not to be obsessed with food, not to be regaining the weight, having to regain, lose, gain, lose, no, no more of that. I feel good, my health problems are gone. I have a lot of energy. Um, I'll, be, I'll be 69 this year. I have more energy than I've ever had. I, my feet don't swell. I don't have, you know, all the issues a lot of people in my age group have where you know, they've got, you know, a bad back and bad knees and bad feet and they feel bad and they go to the doctor all the time. I, whenever I go to the doctor, the doctor tells me, oh, you're going to, you know, people like you put me out of business because I don't have any problems. Uh, I still do take some medication for my blood pressure, a uh, small dose. I tried to go off it at one time but I still felt like I needed to be on it because I don't want my blood pressure to creep up I figure if I'm doing everything I'm doing and you know still you know all the cardio and the healthy eating and my blood pressure is still elevated that maybe I just need to stay on the medication because um, I don't want to risk that so um, you know that's my story and that's why I keep doing the 21 day challenges and teaching the classes and I still plan to stay healthy and three years is coming up soon in May. I'm gonna celebrate my three years on the Daily Dozen, but I'll keep doing the challenges. And I'd love to see your comments on the diet culture and the diet things you tried and how you feel about giving up dieting, okay? So I hope you subscribe to my channel. It's uh, usually about cooking. I usually don't talk, but um, you know, I thought this was something I wanted to have captured so that I could refer you to it if you needed to hear it. So that's my diet story and uh, I hope that you subscribe to my channel so that you can see my great cooking videos which is what I really do better and thank you all if you did listen to this thank you for listening to it. Also I have um, a website chef-julia.com I have 55 classes on there so every class I've taught on Zoom is on my website along with eight ebooks and merchandise, and I have retreats. So one thing that you might consider is for the rest of the year, I have retreats here at my house, 
in Azle, Texas, and you spend eight hours with me and we cook together. And we have speakers and we have different things going on, but it's, it's kind of a way to take some time for yourself and come and hear about why you decided to make the decision to eat this way, to be in this way of life, to adopt this lifestyle, whatever you want to do. But it's on my website too. It's called um, Chef Julia Retreats. So whatever you do, whether it's watching me on YouTube, Facebook, on my website, um, you know, I'm just happy that you are giving me any time that you're giving me. It means a lot to me to have your support. And thank you very much. Bye-bye for now.